Tonight on the Michael Geeky Podcast, we're diving into the rapidly changing world of the online cube community with a special guest, Howard from Booming Acres. If you've been around a while, you know that back in the day, growing mushrooms was like a rite of passage. Everyone wanted to do it all themselves, from prepping grain to pasteurizing substrate, just to prove they could. But times are changing, and so are the needs of new growers. Today's cultivators are skipping the trial and error and looking for top-notch, reliable supplies that just work. That's where companies like Booming Acres comes in, providing beginner-friendly sterilized grains, ready-to-use substrates, and quality agar products to streamline the entire process. So if you're tired of messy DIY setups and want to hear from someone helping new growers get started on the right foot, stick around. This episode is just for you. Yo, welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, where we explore the fascinating world of mushrooms and the people who love them. From expert cultivators to passionate foragers, we bring you deep conversations, cutting edge insights, and everything mycology. Whether you're a seasoned mycophile or just curious, we invite you to geek out with us on the wonders of fungi and join the mushroom movement. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast. The podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Mike O'Geeky, and glad to be with you tonight. We got a great show. We're going to sit down with Howard of Booming Acres. Uh, Howard's been in in the grain and substrate Nagar game for a while now. I knew him back when he was just one guy in a room, you know, trying to make a couple bucks. He now runs a legitimate business, and I think... uh, just seemed like the right time to have him on. We uh been talking a lot about the the ever evolving uh online cubensis cultivating community and uh you know times are definitely changing, things are evolving and uh so it's the right time to talk to talk to Howard tonight. So we're going to do that before we do that though. I want to shout out my Patreon supporters. Uh you guys, you guys pay the bills. It's that easy. Um, if you guys go away, the show goes away. I, I can't can't make it any more clear than that. Um, so everybody that supports me or who has supported me in the past, uh, I love you. I thank you. I really appreciate you guys helping me do what I do. Um, also got a quick shout out, Stealthy Spores. He's got the new uh, Summer Deck 2024 Summer Deck. Um, check it out. Got some cool cards there. Uh, he sent me a, a couple extra decks. Uh, we thought something got misplaced in the mail. Now I'm sitting on some extra summer decks, guys. I think that means it's time for a giveaway. So we're going to do a giveaway on the Discord. Uh, if you guys want, if you're not in my Discord, get in it. There's already like a couple thousand people there. So it's a good community. We got a lot going on there. And uh, Monday, Tuesday, somewhere around there, I'm going to set up the giveaway. And we'll we'll get somebody a uh, nice, you know, $100 worth of stealthy sports cards man so you guys can get playing um so if you're if you're interested in playing that game if you'd like to get your hands on some decks uh but you're you're kind of low on scratch hop in the discord enter to win guys enter to win also want to shout out the homie dichotomous keys uh one of my buds been friends with him for a long time uh got to hang out with him in in mexico it was a real good time him and happy uh we're, we're cruising around looking for all sorts of cool stuff. He sent me some, sent me a cool t-shirt. Dichotomous Keys Genetics. Love that logo, guys. You see that DK logo? That's fresh to death. Yes, I referenced the late 1980s, early 1990s. The pop terminology there. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself. I'm old. I just turned 48, guys. I just turned 48. My birthday was a few days ago. Anyway, uh, he also sent me, check this out, uh, agar agar powder. Agar's not enough. You need agar agar. Perfect for mycology, 250 grams per bag. Dichotomouskeys.com, superior gel strength agar powder. This stuff is amazing. I've run it a couple times. He sent me a bunch. I mean, should I guess maybe we should do a giveaway on some of this stuff too, right? Yeah, I guess we'll have to do that. So, uh, yeah, like I said, we're going to do some giveaways here uh, early next week. He also sells grafting tape. Um, He sells a bunch of stuff. He just sent me a few things so I could, you know, wet the whistle, so to speak, uh, do some giveaways uh, for everybody. So 
So we'll be doing that next week. Um, don't forget if you're going to buy something at Stealthy Spores, use promo code Geeky for ten percent off. Proceeds go to Michael Mama's Mycelium Revolution. Going to get to hang out with Michael Mama's at Nama here in uh, I guess less than a month now. So it's going to be some good times. So I'm get to hang out with the Mamas. Yes, cannot wait. It's going to be fun. If you guys are going to Nama, let me know, man. We got to hang out. It'll be fun. Um, all right. So tonight. We're going to talk to the real deal. Um, he's not the only real deal. There's, there. I got a, I got a handful of friends that really know what they're doing and provide really high quality uh, Michael supplies for people who grow mushrooms at home and people who, who grow them as a business. Uh, but, but Howard's been doing a long time. He takes it real seriously. Uh, he's been in my Discord from day one, and uh, he's always there to help out and uh, help help new growers figure some stuff out. And I think really this day and age, there's a lot of people coming in the space now. And you know what? They're not trying to buy a flow hood. They're not trying to um, convert their entire basement in, into a lab. Do you know what I mean? They just want to try the medicine. And I can tell you for a fact, even though the, the core of this podcast has been about getting real deep on cultivation, at the core... The whole reason I did this was because I wanted to make it easier for people to figure out how to source by growing their own mushrooms so they could uh, see, see what psilocybin was all about, see if it might help them with uh, some, some struggles they're going through. So this is right in line. I mean, you know what? I have helped a bunch of people grow medicine quickly and easily, and they go, cool, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I'm not a cultivator. I just need to grow some mushrooms from time to time because I don't want to worry about where I'm going to get my mushrooms from. So uh, guys like Howard are really filling the niche um, and, and he's providing high quality products to a lot of people. And I've just watched this guy, uh, me and a few of my mods, you know, we've known him a long time and he just keeps leveling up. He's taking it real serious. So uh, I think it's, it's going to be a real cool story to get to hear his perspective on uh the the community the 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 marketplace and kind of what he's all about so without further ado let's do it all right welcome to the show howard of booming acres what's up man ah just uh hanging out at work you know having fun here yes well from man so here's what i know i, re I remember when it, when we first met and you joined my discord and uh we met through uh, a mutual friend um i remember you know you were you were doing this on a very small scale and then I remember like a year ago seeing an ad, you, you were, you were saying I'm hiring for third shift. And I said, okay, Howard's got third shift employees now. So he must be crank. I mean, he must be buying his stuff by the truckload and shipping it out by the pallet. So, uh, yeah, you're at work. Of course you are. So yeah. Where you yeah. Are. Um, yeah, it's definitely been, uh, just like a constant rise over here. Yeah. I love it. Well, how about this? So before we get into the business um, and, and what you do and what you provide for everybody, talk me through, uh, this is what we do at the Michael Geeky Podcast. I got to have your first mushroom memory followed by, um, you know, your Michael origin story. So first time mushrooms hit your radar and then like how you became to be Howard of Booming Acres, how you have a life in mushrooms, how, how that interest developed. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I grew up uh, down in the southwest in New Mexico, um, so really not a lot of mushrooms out there. Um, I think the first time I really saw mushrooms growing in the wild, we took like a family trip out to Colorado, and I remember seeing just like a huge cluster of mushrooms on a tree out there, and it was like, well, that's kind of neat. That's, you know, there's always trees and bushes and stuff, and it was like, that's like a different, like, plant that I never see, so... Yeah, I kind of vividly remember seeing something that was different in nature that just wasn't, you know, wasn't part of my ecosystem. And um, yeah, I mean, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, so that was kind of cool. Um, I got more into mushrooms when I was uh, like finishing up high school, really um, kind of, you know, exploring the, uh, the intellectual side of things, you could say the, uh, the mysterious part of life. Um, so yeah, made some friends that way. Um, made a friend with someone who, uh, wasn't actually a friend and, you know, 
took some cash from us at one point and uh that led to the whole thing of like well we could just do this ourselves um so yeah that kind of kicked off you know learning about mushrooms learning where they come from um you know finding online forums i've always been like part of online groups for for mushrooms um yeah, and just going from there, learning how to do everything, um, getting involved with with that kind of scene, um, having people teach me, then me teaching, you know, the next group of people. Um, yeah, and kind of just always stuck around in that that aspect. Um, as uh, as I learned more, you know, got more comfortable, did more grows. Um, it kind of it stays more fun as, as you're doing it, you know, exploring different, different aspects of things and different ways of doing things. And so, yeah, I've just always kind of been involved in, in cultivation and, and learning and trying to expand my knowledge of, uh, of mycology. So when was that? Like, give me a timeline. So are we talking five years ago, seven years ago, three years ago, how far back was that early, early learning about cultivation? When did that start? That was in 2009. Um, yeah, early 2009. Um, yeah, got into like learning and about how to do things with, uh, with a friend. Um, and yeah, just started with, you know, some PF tech cake cakes. Um, that was really like the, the most understood methodology for growing back then. Um, so we started with that and then I found out about, you know, mono tubs, um, kind of did that for a while. Bags weren't a thing back then. Um, yeah. And, you know, as, as the years have gone by, it's been like 15 years now, you know, the, the cultivation scene has changed a lot. The online cultivation scene has changed a lot. The different techniques and methodology has changed a lot. So yeah, kind of started from not, not the earliest days, but I'd say started from the days of there really wasn't pictures for guides because it was a lot harder to upload pictures back then. There weren't, you know, cheap digital cameras that everybody had in their pockets. So, um, yeah, it went from like having to read about how to do everything to now being able to see, you know, videos online about everything. So, all right. So, so 2009 PF tech. So did, did you read like the McKenna book? Did you like, how, how did, where were you getting your information back then? Uh, yeah. So there was a book that my friend had. Um, and then the website that we, uh, that I ended up congregating towards was, uh, Mycotopia. Um, they had a lot of really cool people on there. Um, I've, kind of kept up with uh with one of the guys on there um i i don't frink with that forum anymore every now and then i'll go on you know shroomery um shroomery was just starting to come around back then um but yeah it was uh there was one book that we used for like the actual recipes and it was like well this is better than people on the internet so we did stuff from that book and then the internet side of things was where I found out about, uh, like processing corn, um, and getting mono tubs and actually making substrate and whatnot, like upgrading from the PF tech. Man. So, so you're, you're in that era. You're kind of like with Dave Wombat and some of these other guys who, who go back quite a ways, more than a decade. And you went from having, I mean, you're going so far back. You're talking about like not having a smartphone and that, that there just weren't photographs available to, to now. I mean, it, it has come a long way. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Do you miss the old days, the adventure of seeking out new information of, you know, going, wow, we did it to now, like, you know, it, how do you think it's different now? Uh, the old days were kind of fun. Um, there was a lot more, I'd say, like trial and error. Um, people nowadays, you know, they call it like fuck around and find out. Uh, there was a lot of that going on, um, probably a lot more failures than successes back then. Uh, there wasn't a deep understanding of how things actually functioned. Um, it was a lot of just like, do this because it worked for me. It might work for you. If it doesn't, I don't know why. Um, there was a lot of that back then. There were definitely some ground rules for things uh, as far as like sterilizing things and um, avoiding contamination. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of resources on exactly why these things were happening. Um, nowadays there definitely seems to be more of an attitude of kind of like, don't fuck around and find out sometimes, especially on like Reddit, people will be like, yeah, don't do that. It's a waste of time. You're, you're not going to get that much from that. You should do this because you're, you're going to get a better yield or 
whatever, what have you. Um, there's also nowadays, since there is so much information, a lot of the people that are experimenting with like different things, they're there's other people that are more likely to be able to point out like, no, someone's already done that. Don't waste your time. And a lot of the time, depending on the for, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the forum, people can be a little bit rude about it rather than, you know, like, oh, that's cool. You're exploring a little bit of science stuff. You're having fun with the project. There's more of just like, why are you wasting your time? Why would you do that? Someone else has done it. It's don't bother. Um, yeah, that's really changed a lot uh, in the last uh probably within the last like five years, I'd say, I'd say people got a lot more like jaded towards actually just like trying things out. Yeah. So the, you know, the find out is still there, but the, the fuck around is not uh, the same. You used to have to fuck around cause you didn't, cause you had to find out. Now you got these people online who are just like, why are you fucking around? And I stopped doing that a long time ago. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm raining on somebody's parade. They they want to try something. And I'm like, you know what? That's that's actually cool. That's that's in the spirit of how this whole community originated in the first place. Those people FAFO'd, figured, figured out what worked, what didn't. Some of these guys, you could tell them absolutely for a fact, the thing you're doing is not gonna work. And they will resent you for telling them that because you take you're taking away their fun. They want to be like little amateur scientists. They want to try these things. They they do want to experiment. So I, I think it's interesting you you highlight that shift about five years ago. For sure, the last two or three years, you just have um, a lot of people online who are almost indignated by the the new people coming in. Just like, well, why don't you already know that? We all know that there's so much information now. Why on earth are you trying this stupid idea that we all know is not going to work? And, and, and I just go back to, but it's got to be fun. Cool. You wasted a few bucks. You made some sub that contaminated, but you did figure something out. You figured out how not to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's the only thing that I really wouldn't advise someone, you know, mess around with is like actually growing contamination if if someone's growing something where it's obviously bad it's like no throw that away you're risking you know getting sick there are some contaminants where it's obvious that it's you know really bad so like you'll see people growing something where it's purple and they're like oh it looks cool i'm gonna keep it growing and it's like no that could be like actually dangerous so you need to throw that away um other than that yeah it's like most of these materials don't cost a lot of money um if somebody's already purchased it it's like it's not your dollar just go ahead and you know try things out and then you might learn a lesson you might learn you know what not to do a lot of the time failures teach more than actual successes so um yeah having that you know indignation that someone's trying something out when it's not on your dime or your time like what's what's the harm in it so yeah there's definitely a a nice way that you can tell someone like hey no someone's done that you're wasting your time or like don't expect what you're you're trying to do to work and then there's just a rude way to say it so yeah it's it's definitely uh definitely interesting how that comes out online yeah i get do you get these people and this is sort of a prequel to the next question but the the people who these days right if they're willing to follow some directions things can go well for them right away and they, they, they get some grows going, and then they start sourcing genetics from a few different places. Maybe they get a little lax in some of their techniques. And then all of a sudden, six months later, after they've had all the success, now they start getting contamination, they're failing, and they get very frustrated because they go, wait, I'm a good grower. Why is this happening to me? And I'm like, well, you bypassed the step most of us went through, which was starting with failed grows, starting with contamination, knowing what it looked like. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's a it's kind of a new predicament some of these new growers get in, and and it takes having people like you, like me, like all the people that are in our community that have done this long enough to kind of know what's going on, to to guide them through those situations. So, kind of saying that, I'm curious, and, and I, I I have seen you very active in in my Discord, especially back in the day, and I've seen you active in other Discords. Talk to me about the role um, that you play in the myco community beyond just supplying 
Myco supplies for people? Like how, why, how do you view your involvement in these online forums, in Discord servers, in, in Reddit subthreads, things like that? And, and kind of why do you do what you do? Uh, yeah, so for me, explaining how to do things, teaching people, I, I really enjoy that. We've started, you know, teaching classes with um, one of the grocery stores that's here. We just did a class with them. Um, we did another class with the um, Chicago Mushroom Club. Um, I just enjoy teaching people about something that I enjoy. Um, it doesn't all have to be, you know, go and find out the information yourself. You can look it up. It is kind of fun to, you know, be part of the community have some interaction with people. Um, I have posted on Reddit, like since 2009. Um, I think I got my first Reddit account around like 2008. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always commented on people's Reddit stuff um, and various hobby groups that I'm in, just trying to help teach people. Um, Reddit doesn't really have like old forums. Old forums used to have, you know, like you could give people reputation. And so you would get like a bar under your name that says like this person knows what they're talking about. And so Reddit doesn't have that. Reddit's kind of uh, like pervasive where basically after 24 hours, not many people are going to see your post. And so the more that you can share information, the more threads that you go on, the more likely you are to help more people because they're not going to be able to, you know, verify that somebody actually knows what they're talking about. And so I just try to go on and, you know, spread information and make sure that no one's getting, you know, really incorrect information. Um, I see posts all the time where someone comments and they're like, well, I just finished my first grow and, and this doesn't look like how mine did. So it's bad. And it's just either like a different type of mushroom, you know, they've, they've, they might've only grown say like oyster or reishi and they're talking about somebody who's growing lion's mane and the mycelium looks very different. And so they're like, oh no, that's contamination hundred percent. It's like, no, that's just lion's mane mycelium, you know, it looks a little bit different. And so um, having that confidence sometimes from other growers, and then being able to step in and be like, actually, you know, I've, I've been doing this for a little while. So here's, you know, some more information. Um, yeah, just being able to help out as many people as possible, I think it's beneficial. Um, same with the discords, you know, discord, you can kind of build up a little bit of a reputation because, you know, it's the same people. You kind of have a lot of the people that are in there, you know, throughout the week or every other day or something. And so if you say something, people will, you know, give it a little like or whatever. And so you kind of build up a reputation that way. Um, if, if like I, in your discord, I hang out in the grain channel a lot. So I'll see people posting, like, can I use an Instapot that gets to 13? And it's like, you're going to have to cook it for longer. You know, it, it might be the same answer they could have looked up online, but it's like, here's the answer. And then like 10 people can give it a thumbs up. And it's like, yeah, there we go. We helped, we helped one more person, you know, get through it without having to deal with a bunch of nasty people or, you know, spending, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes online. Um, so yeah, helping out people, I just really enjoy doing that. Um, I probably get it from my mom. My mom was a teacher for like 35 years or something. She just retired. So, um, yeah, helping people a lot is good. Um, for us as a business, uh, that's a lot, like that's a big role for me here. I handle all of our customer service stuff. Um, so I do all the emails, all of our Instagram, um, and then all of like just any messages that come through, I, I help, th I handle those. So when people are messaging us about like contamination or anything, um, you know, I've got a couple like canned responses, you could say like, there are people who, yeah, they've grown once or twice, they had success, and now they have a failure. And it's like, well, you can't really expect to be 100% in everything all the time. There's, there's going to be something that comes up eventually. Um, a lot of the time, I, I compare it to walking around, you know, I've, I've been walking for over 30 years. And every now and then I might trip on the sidewalk, you know, sometimes something just happens. Um, a lot of the time, it is something that just is small and gets overlooked. Uh, maybe a mistake was made. Maybe you tried doing something different and it didn't work out. Uh, I've had people where they, a big one that comes up is I use these genetics on a previous grow and they worked fine. I ask them like, well, did you use a new needle for your inoculation? And they're like, no, it's, I hit the, the needle with a lighter and it's like, well, it screws on with a piece of plastic. That part of the needle doesn't get heated up. And if you just had it sitting out for, you know, two or three months, something growing in there. Um, that one comes up 
quite a bit. So, um, yeah, even if your genetics were good the first time, they might not be, you know, two or three months later, you might need to change out your needles. Uh, yeah. So that stuff kind of comes up. And again, it is, um, for me, like we've gotten to the point with the business where, yeah, we, we do send a lot of replacements out for people that ask for them. I'd rather have the customer be happy. So nine times out of 10, if somebody says like, Hey, I ran into this issue, we just send a replacement. I make sure that they're as informed as they can be about what might've caused the issue, how they can amend it for the next time. And, uh, yeah, we will send out a replacement. Um, luckily enough, we've gotten large enough where, where we can do that. We can make sure that people are happy. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time it does come down to a conversation with the grower and figuring out what might've gone wrong. Um, a lot of the time we are able to pinpoint, you know, what came up, what happened, where, and send them a new product. They have success with it. They message me back and they're like, Hey, it worked. Thanks. That kind of deal. So, um, yeah, not, not everything can be a hundred percent successful in life, but we, we try and make sure that everybody can be as successful as possible. Um, yeah, it, everybody gets happy that way. For the most part, everybody who's growing these, uh, mushrooms, everybody's going to be pretty cool and pretty open to, uh, learning and understanding new things. So yeah, it's, uh, it's something I enjoy for sure. Man, you just made me think, I mean, what you're doing when you're a vendor, whether you're selling grain, sub, low hoods, uh, jars, LC contraptions, uh, or genetics, it would be the equivalent of if you were a car dealer and you sold cars, but no one knew how to drive. So you not yeah, only got to yeah. sell them the cars, but you got to teach them how to drive. And then when they crash the car, they come back, go, they go, I got to buy another car. And you go, okay, let's try to prevent you from crashing next time. So I'm going to give you some driving tips. That's that it, it's a very unique situation, right? Like if you're Sony and you sell TVs, everybody's, everybody knows what a TV is. You just need a manual, figure out how to, you know, use a couple features. But most things people sell, there, there's already this like tacit built in knowledge of how to use it. This is a very unique situation where most of the people buying from you, or at least a significant part of them, they've never done this before. So they're going to screw up. They're going to make mistakes. And if you're working customer service, I mean, that it's almost like you have to play that role of educator. How, how could you not? Yeah. If, if we don't, then we're the bad guy. Um, yeah. All of our bags, we, we ship them with a, uh, well, all of our all-in-one bags, we ship them with a sticker on it, with a QR code that brings you to a video that explains how to use the product. Um, we have a written guide with pictures on how to use the product. Um, yeah, a lot of it is just like those products are mainly geared towards beginner growers. So we have to account for them not having a hundred percent of the understanding. Um, and yeah, the, the unfortunate part there is only half of the all-in-one bags that we sell, we include the genetics for that's our gourmet all-in-one bags. The other types of bags, the magical all-in-one grow bags, we don't sell genetics for those. And so we do have to rely on other people out there to be delivering quality products alongside ours. Um, if someone's, you know, using, you know, unclean materials or, you know, really old materials, something like that, um, they're not going to work. And a lot of the time we'll just get the full blunt of the blame, um, that it is what it is. That's why we have, you know, an affiliate network, uh, where we, we test and verify that, that their products are good. We work with those vendors to fully warranty both sides of the product so that if somebody does run into a problem, regardless of whose fault it is, both sides will get replaced. Um, there's tons of these fly by night, you know, Instagram vendors or someone just sets up a Shopify website and they're selling, you know, empty syringes or syringes that are six months old, or they've got plenty of contaminants in them. And then they just, no, nope, no, nope, it's, it's a totally on, on the vendor that you bought from. Uh, it's, it's definitely not us. And it's like, dude, you're making these like in your kitchen next to your dinner. Like, no, that's, that's not how this works. So yeah, we, um, yeah, we can, we can do our best to avoid those kinds of issues by pointing people in the right direction. But I mean, with your analogy with cars, it's like, if you took your car to a, a, a dealership to get something fixed and it's like, well, you, you have the wrong oil in your car, the dealership didn't 
put that oil in your car. You got it done by your friend down the street and he's refining his own oil and the oil messed up the car. You're not going to blame the dealer. You're going to blame, you know, whoever was making that oil. But for us, you know, we have to take that blame sometimes. And so, yeah, that's kind of unfortunate, but it, it is what it is. Um, yeah, as long as people are pointed in the right direction, a lot of the time it, it tends to work out, you know, really well. We we really don't have to warranty too many of the uh, the affiliate vendors. I think we've done one uh, in like the last six months where someone used our product with the affiliates, um, genetic materials, and something happened, something went bad, and you know it could be any number of things. But yeah, no, ninety nine percent of the time when they use you know quality trusted materials. With our quality, trusted materials, everything works out good. So many variables. There are so many variables to this, right? You can control your product 99.9% .9 of the time. And the, the LC guy can, depending upon his approach and methodology and testing regime and protocol, he, he can ensure that. But the thing none of you guys can, can ensure or control is the environment people are doing all this work in. So, so, so again, the education piece becomes so important. So just that's frequently the variable or the, the one that gets me is you tell everybody exactly what to do. And then I'm sure you've gotten this one and they go, yeah, everything's screwed up. I think it's your bags. And you start talking through what they did. They're, did you cook it for two and a half hours? No, I cooked it for 90 minutes. All right. Did you do this? Did you do that? No, 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 no. Well, I thought I'd do this. Well, I thought I'd do that. You're like, okay, man. I mean, if you don't start from following the directions, it's like when you buy a piece of furniture from Ikea. I mean, the, just follow the instructions if you want the furniture to come together. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll, get, we'll get people, uh, you know, we had a guy, he bought a bunch of uh, like three pound sawdust uh, substrate bags. So it's the cheapest item on our website that we sell in a bag and he bought those and he inoculated them with uh with spores and he's messaging us all angry about it it's like dude it says on the listing don't do that it won't grow anything it doesn't have an injection port on it like why why did you do that like that's not on us that's on you you bought something you didn't understand what it is or how to use it or anything like you can't teach someone not to do that they just purchased something thought they knew what they were doing and they just totally got it wrong. And it's like, I, I mean, I can't fix that. Like we, we can't just like give you a full refund. You can't send that back. You used it and you didn't use it right. You, it's kind of up to the consumer to do like the, the basis amount of research onto what you're doing. But uh, yeah, you can't really fix that situation. You can't. I mean, man, my first job was at Target as a kid and I worked uh, the front lines in the returns and man, the stuff people would have the audacity to return, like, you know, half a box of diapers used up, but they want all their money back. Um, bed sheets that were so filthy and disgusting. I literally told them, go home, wash those bed sheets, then bring them back. I'm not touching those dirty ass bed sheets. People will push their luck, right? Um, and I, I guess a lot of the micro supply vendors, I mean, on one level, you almost got to have a FAFO policy where it's like, if you're, if you're buying our products to FAFO, uh, odds are, if something goes wrong, don't come knocking to us. Cause you're literally fucking around and trying to find out. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, yeah, it'd be, sometimes it would be nice to just be like, knock it out of here. But, um, yeah, you, you, you got to deal with it sometimes. Uh, yeah, it is what it is. Um, unfortunately, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of this, um, this hobby, the blame does get put onto vendors. Um, it's interesting cause I'll also go on like cannabis subreddits. And for the most part, if somebody has something that doesn't work on the cannabis subreddits, nobody blames the vendors. It's pretty much always, what did you do? What's your environment? what steps are you doing here? Whatever you did messed it up. Like the vendor is not responsible for this. And that's pretty much like every product, every, uh, every help thread that I see, it's, it's basically never the vendor that gets blamed. And then it's such a, uh, such a change comparing it to the mycology help forums where it's, Oh, what vendor did you get from? 
no matter who gets mentioned, there's going to be someone who's like, they're absolutely terrible, never go with them. Uh, and that's on all sides of everything. It's even like people setting up like Martha tents, they'll be like, oh, that Martha tent's terrible. You didn't need to buy that. And it's like, dude, it's just a tent. Like, what are you talking about? So yeah, it's really interesting to see like the difference between like the different hobbies, the different growing hobbies and how people react with the, um, with the blame situation where on one hand, it's always the vendor's fault. And then on the other hand, it's always the, the customer's fault, the grower's fault. But now, so I've never grown cannabis. I've, I've paid attention to a few buddies who have, but you know, if I buy some, some feminized seeds, uh, I can put, I can pour them out. I can look them at, look at them in my hand. I can roll them around in the palm of my hand. I can put them back in and I can plant those seeds, right? Like the sterility yeah. issue of what is vended tends to be less of an issue. Whereas man, name of the game in mushroom cultivation is truly understanding sterility, why it matters, when it really matters, when it matters less, and and understanding how contamination works. How does airborne contamination work? How does, you know, tactile, point of contact, high touch situation, you know, contamination work? That it's so, I think that's what's so different about it. And isn't that crazy that in one community, then just no one would ever blame the vendor. And yet in this community, it's, that's definitely the go-to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, to me, there's a interesting difference between the two because with, with cannabis and plants, there's so many steps that are hands-on, you know, with, with plants, you're watering every day, you're doing nutrients, you know, every day, that kind of stuff. You're, you're trimming the plants, you're adjusting the light, you're doing time cycles, humidity, this, that, and the other thing. There's so many, they basically each step of the process, you're hands on, um, with mushrooms, it really is, you do one thing. And if you don't do that first step, right, it's going to go bad. Um, you can have your product sitting and waiting for two weeks. It's good. Once you touch it, if you touch it the wrong way, you know, it's going to go bad in like two days, three days, you're going to know if you messed it up with plants, you know, you're doing something every single day. And you might see the change very quickly, but typically it does take, you know, a couple of days to see changes in plants. And so, um, yeah, it's interesting how there is that, that, you know, kind of different major difference between the two where, um, on one side, the vendors are fully required to like warranty everything, even with the customer's interactions. And on the other side, it's really just like, no, nah, that's, it's all on you. So yeah, kind of an interesting, uh, interesting situation there for sure it is all right so so you're you're a very large micro supplier in, in the sign line cube community in, in the online gourmet community you transcend those those two little clicks for sure you're seeing firsthand who's buying what when they're buying it how they're buying it why they're buying it all that good stuff because you're talking to them as well um what what trends are you seeing emerging uh, more recently? Like in, in the last year or two, are you seeing changes? Um, yeah, I mean, we are getting uh, fairly sizable. It is, uh, you know, always trying to go up. Um, right now, we we kind of have our, our standard product. You know, we do aim for uh, beginner growers, helping out beginner growers get started, getting their first grow. So the all-in-one kits are always selling. Um, right now, we're starting to see more and more gourmet growers. Um, we used to sell like maybe 10 syringes of uh, gourmet Genex a week. And now it's not unheard of for us to have, you know, five, five to 10 every day getting sold. Um, I think that that partially is because people are, you know, being more informed and learning more about the benefits of um, gourmet mushrooms. So uh, gourmet medicinal mushrooms, I should say. Uh, so like lion's mane, reishi, those are selling a lot more than they used to. Uh, and then, yeah, just people wanting to grow their own food is becoming more of a thing. So, um, yeah, even the oysters are oyster genetics, um, our Piopino genetics, chestnuts, that's starting to sell a lot more. Uh, we are selling a lot more of the gourmet all in one bag. So those are definitely catching on a lot more. Um, I think that overall the average consumer for our products, they, um, it's almost a 50, 50 mix of people who are interested in, uh, you know, the magical all in one bags versus the gourmet bags. Um, 
it's starting to trend more towards that where each week now we used to be able to make like 20 of the gourmet bags and those would last us, you know, two weeks. And now we make those like twice a week. So it's definitely picked up there. Um, also the, uh, our bulk customers that we sell to whenever we're sending out pallets of material, um, we used to have more, uh, people who would pay, you know, ask if they can come by and drop off cash kind of situations, that kind of stuff. Um, and now we, we are supplying farms with, uh, with grain and substrate. They're, um, they're happy to send over, you know, their, their tax exempt forms. Um, so we're seeing kind of a bigger change that might just be, you know, cause we're becoming a larger business. So we have more of a reputation. So these farms, you know, they can, you know, trust us to send out, you know, 2000 pounds of grain to them. Whereas before, you know, we were just a small, small shop on Etsy, you know, we're not going to get buyers for that kind of thing, but yeah, it seems there's more people that are more interested in gourmet mushrooms. Um, yeah, I, that'd be, that would be the main shift that I think, uh, that we see. Um, also there are more people that are buying the individual components, uh, than just the all in one kits. Um, there's more people that are buying substrate and grain versus just buying the kits. Um, I think that people are learning more knowledge and so they're thinking like, oh, well, I've already grown in an all in one or I've already done cakes. So let's try out a monotub. Let's try out, you know, a shoebox, a tub tub, whatever. Um, yeah. And that, that could be, you know, we do have a high customer uh, return rate. And so a lot of those customers, they start with the all in one bags and then they start getting the, the grain and substrate and doing it, doing it all themselves. And I, I answer a couple emails a week where it's that exact situation where they're like, all right, I had a, I had success. I had a really good growth. So now I want to try the next thing. And uh, yeah, I think as more people are informed, as more people learn, as the information becomes more widely available, that's going to be the trend is, is towards more uh, hands-on, more, more uh, interactive grows. Yeah. So that's fascinating. You say that because I'm, I'm talking right now, a woman emailed me. I think she's uh, early seventies trying to grow some, some magic mushrooms and she's been having a lot of failure. She's, gotten what she thinks is good advice. I did just get her in the discord. So, so we'll see, but she's really starting to worry. Like, you know, my basement's pretty moldy. I, I'm just wondering if I'm fighting a losing battle. And I said, I'm gonna make it real easy for you. Go to booming acres, buy an all in one bag, but buy, buy, I'm gonna tell you where to go buy your LC from. You virtually can't screw it up. Like follow a couple basic steps. But, but you, we've, by doing those two things, you're eliminating all the most common places where, where the contamination, uh, event occurs. And so, you know, I, I, I've done this before it's worked out great, but 100%, um, sometimes people do that and they go, oh, cool. Right. You know, I just, uh, I want to do mushrooms once a year, maybe twice a year. I got a, I got a, a, an event coming up in the summer that I'd love to have some for us. So I'm going to buy a couple all in one bags and grow them. And th that's all they ever need. They, they don't want to go further, but the people who go, Oh, this was cool. This is like why people like gardening. This is fun. Yes. They, the all in one bag is just not as much fun. You just, you want to do more things. You want to have more control over the variables. And yeah, I, I, that, that makes a lot of sense that people do that. What I didn't realize was that, um, I think just the broad appeal of mushrooms now, people are, I think maybe back in the day, it's one thing to try magic mushrooms as a kid at a party. It's another to start incorporating mushrooms more and more into your cuisine, what you're eating every day. Um, and, and I think the messaging is succeeding. People are going, oh, these are good for us. I, sh I, I should give them a try. Oh, lion's mane makes me more mentally alert. What? It improves my neural function, really, by eating a mushroom? And so, yeah, that's, that's cool. With the all-in-one bags, I mean, if you're growing magic mushrooms with our bags, you can get three or four ounces from them. And that's plenty for, you know, a small group of friends to have for, you know, a year, if not longer. Um, but someone might grow and be like, that was a really fun project, but I don't need more of these mushrooms. So what else can I grow? They hear about lion's mane and it's like one of our all-in-one bags, the gourmet all-in-one bags. You can grow, you know, a pound, pound and a half of lion's mane and then dehydrate that. And that would cost you if you're buying, you know, lion's mane substrate or uh, 
uh, supplements that would cost, you know, over a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars to buy it in pill form, and it's like you can just grow it yourself, dehydrate it, and put it in capsules. Or like I had lines me in my coffee every morning, and the amount that I go through, I would be spending hundreds of dollars just to do that. And it's like you can just grow it for you know thirty bucks, you know. And I think more people are catching on to that, enjoying the hobby, you know, finding out different avenues for you know, having a new hobby, being hands on with with their health, being hands on with the food that they're eating. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely moving in a positive direction, I think. I agree. I mean, I, I had a guy on the show who uh, one of his buddies, he does a capoeira, what is it the like Brazilian, like dancey martial art. He, he, so he, he had a friend who did that. And him and his friend are doing this at the park, the friend goes here, try one of my lines main supplements. And the the effect was so pronounced for him. He said, wait a minute, what is this? This is a mushroom. And he was so impressed. He he bought some supplements. And then the next thing you know, he had the exact thought that you were talking about, which is, boy, these supplements are going to put me, you know, I'm going to have to take a second mortgage out on my home here pretty soon. These are not cheap. Let me look into growing this. And now it's like his whole life. He, he, he grows everything under the sun. He's, he's got hired by a local tissue culture lab to, to do, you know, some mushroom cultivation work. You think about Microdex? <laughs> oh, yeah, you know Microdex, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. talk with him, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, I mean, that's just such a cool story, right? That, and, and this is how, for the people that are going, well, the jury's out and we haven't seen enough evidence, all of us in this community are like, man, you know what? If this is bullshit, um, it's like the greatest scam of all time because there's just independently tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are all independently saying the same thing. Yeah, I mean, that's that kind of goes back to, you know, the legislation that they passed way back in like the 60s and stuff. It's like there's all these positive benefits and it's obvious. So what are you doing? And yeah, I think that we're seeing a trend uh, more towards uh, the right direction with that. Um, yeah, there's there's all these, you know great anecdotes um and now we just have to kind of wait for the science to catch up um and then hopefully with that you know legislation will change too luckily lion's mane isn't really uh legislated um yeah just fda requirements which is a whole bunch of fun twos but um you can't breed lions but you can cultivate lion's mane <laughs> there you go there, there there you go there you go um well so so you you tr- you're focusing on the new grower and yet you're talking about having uh, some, some farms wanting to buy stuff from you. How do you balance that as, as a business? And has that evolved over time? As far as like anticipating um, trends, as far as like, uh, you know, keeping like inventory, um, we really can't. Um, we basically everything that we sell, the longest that it'll sit on a shelf is like maybe five days. Um, and that's with us working you know, five days a week, uh, two shifts a day, um, full production capacity. Um, yeah, the amount that we sell is, uh, it it keeps us busy. And so we can't really account for, oh, well, we think that, you know, people are going to want millet next week. Um, we do kind of try to keep inventory, but for the most part, whenever we come in Monday and Tuesday, it's all been purchased over the weekend. Um, so that's kind of good for us because we do try to make everything to order. Um, we don't want stuff sitting for a long time because then people get upset. Um, even like we send stuff to Amazon for Amazon to deliver with Prime. And so we seal those up in vacuum seal bags. And even with that being a closed system, people will get upset if they see that it's, you know, two or three weeks old. Um, so, yeah, anything that we send, it's been made very recently. Um, really how we handle um how we handle things is we do know that people will be purchasing a lot of all-in-one bags and so on our typical day we'll make you know an allocated amount of those just because we know how many on average will sell and in between that that's when we make those orders for the for the bulk purchases um we can squeeze in with with how we can process things uh we can squeeze in you know a couple hundred bags at a time if we need to of different grains or different substrates. And so if we get, you know, a call from a farm and they're like, Hey, we need 400 or 500, three pound 
oat bags. When can you have them? We tell them, okay, well, we can plan out for making a hundred bags every day. Those will be to you. Um, like we can send it out next Wednesday, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, basically we just, uh, do our best to make sure that we give accurate lead times and then account for that. Um, if we're really busy during the week, then, uh, I talk to the guys that are making all the stuff and I'm like, Hey, who wants overtime? Who wants to work on Saturday? And, uh, a lot of the time, you know, we've got a really great team here. A lot of people are willing to come in on Saturday. If they want the extra cash, it's an easy shift. Um, so yeah, they'll come in, we'll get the order made up and then, uh, yeah, it'll get out on time and, um, yeah, it helps just make everything keep on moving. I want to get into the labor piece, but, but first, um, walk me through, uh, I vaguely remember a long time ago, you on a channel talking about all in one bags. And I, I, I remember people debating, do you put the sub on top? Do you put the grain on top? Um, I think for a minute, I forget who it was, but somebody was putting straw in between it. Um, how, how has that whole product developed over time? Is it, is it pretty similar to where you started? Has, have you made a lot of changes? What, what are the challenges with that product? Because I know for the longest time, most people in the community said an all-in-one bag doesn't work. And yet some of you guys persisted and said, no, well, we got to figure it out because we know it's a product that should exist. Kind of tell me that that story from, from the Booming Acres perspective. Uh, yeah, so when we first started making all-in-one bags, um, really the only all-in-one bags that were widely available were the mixed all-in-one bags, the pre-mixed all-in-one bags. Um, I have some contacts that know some of the companies uh, that were doing that. And we found out that they were making those bags by, they would make their substrate and they would just add a lot of extra water to the substrate. They would, at the end of mixing the substrate, they would throw in dry bags of millet. Uh, and then the idea is that it should be an even mix. You should have, you know, X percentage of millet in the bag. And then that millet will absorb X amount of moisture from the substrate. And then you get an all-in-one bag that should function properly. There's a lot of variables in that that don't really work out too well if, you know, something doesn't add up right, if the moisture content in the air is different and the starting material is different on the grain side of things, on the substrate side of things. So really, they're just cutting corners, making things however they want. Um, those bags, whenever they're made, you're also, or when they're used, you're also kind of hoping that the mycelium will start around some grain you're, you're hoping that it'll find some grain immediately and then be able to use that grain immediately to spread out um that doesn't typically work too well because one the mycelium is immediately using the energy that it has to go out and find more food so it's not going to be able to actually use nutrients or energy to produce fruits later because it's spending all of its energy finding food um the whenever we started doing all-in-one bags the obvious thing around that was one produce the components individually to make sure that both sides are done correctly and then have them separate because you want all the energy easily accessible immediately for your mycelium and so you've got the layer of grain and then you want to be able to mix it in with the substrate, kind of how you would do in a monotub, so that once the uh, once all the nutrition is consumed, or most of the nutrition is consumed, then it's going to be looking for the material to grow into, which it'll end up using for the fruits, which is the substrate. Um, substrate mostly holds moisture. Um, that's the main goal of substrate is to hold the moisture, which will then be used for producing the fruits. Um, you already know all that though. Um, yeah. So having the two different layers to me, that seems like an obvious solution to something that shouldn't have been a problem. If, if those vendors were making their bags properly, they would have put them in two layers because it just makes logical sense to me. That's interesting. I have, um, I won't name names, but I've seen some of the people who are doing the, the sort of homogenized all in ones. Um, they're getting better at it. They're definitely improving their, their product, but I will say that I have noticed and, and I wondered why I didn't put too much thought into it, but I think you kind of explained it. You're just more likely to potentially have a pocket of like just a little bit of that cocoa is just under hydrated. 
And so as it colonizes, uh, it, it, it might, that mycelium locally in that area, if both the cocoa is a little underhydrated and it's using up more of its energy just to seek out and find this grain, I have found that there are little pockets of uncolonized uh, cocoa in a block that otherwise looks fine where you're like, okay, why don't I just decide not to colonize that little spot? It still seems to want to, you know, pin or uh, move on into fruiting. But that explains that situation. The way you got it set up, it makes a lot of sense. And the other thing I like about that setup is it also teaches people then. So if you're going, this is a beginner product, this is a first step product, eventually people keep doing this, they're, they're going to be buying two separate products. It's good for your business, but it's also good for them because your all-in-one bag already is educating people about the process of how mushrooms grow most effectively when they're cultivated. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I've, I've definitely sent a lot of people your way. I've not had a single person say anything but good things. So um, it obviously works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely a good, uh, a good teaching concept because it does, it has all of the individual components that are, you know, part of the whole growing process. It's just all in one product. Um, really the all in one bags cost more than doing the, all the work yourself and having it be in a, in another bag or in a, in a tote. It just, uh, it just makes it a lot easier. I mean, if I, uh, right, if I live in New York city and I live in a tiny apartment and I don't definitely don't have room for a flow hood. I don't have room for a still air box, which also takes up a lot of space. Um, some people like maybe they want to do more, but they physically can't. And that all in one bag solves a lot of problems for those people still gives them the freedom to grow mushrooms. Yeah, I mean, like like the the person you were talking about earlier. If 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 you're 70 years old, you're not you know mixing up monotubs of of substrate. You're not wanting to do that. So just being able to have a bag and you just kind of squish it around, like can't really get much easier than that. Um, yeah, and then with the with the premixed bags, yeah, you it's also um, yeah the mycelium is it's millet. Typically, those bags are made with millet and millet doesn't have much nutrition to it it's a small grain and so if it, if you inoculate the bag and it's only touching you know a couple pieces of millet if it's an older culture maybe like a, a more like stingy culture you could say where it doesn't like the millet or it needs a lot of energy to come back from like a dormant state if it's only got you know a couple couple grains of millet it's just not going to happen it's not going to grow as fast it's not going to grow as strong it's going to spend all of its energy you know, looking for more food the entire time, and it's not going to be able to utilize that energy, what little energy there is from that millet. So yeah, it's just uh, overall, I, I would recommend those products. Um, I don't think that we'll ever make those kinds of products either. Um, at least not with the not the way they would do it, and not with millet. So well, if you if you got it all in one bag that works, why would you? If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Like it's it, it's serving its purpose, yeah. Yeah, we do we do little experiments here and there. Um when we first started making the all in one bags, we used uh we used corn. We used feed corn for making them. Um I really like corn personally. It's my favorite grain to grow on still. Um Yeah, it works really well. The only issue was um we used feed corn when we were first starting off. Um the grain supplier that we were getting from didn't have popcorn and so we would just use feed corn. Um feed corn looks a little different than popcorn it's, sometimes it has like pieces of cob and stuff in it you know we would try to pull all that out but sometimes stuff gets through and uh that along with just the appearance of it people go online they see people making popcorn bags and they say like well this doesn't look the same and so they they come at you with questions about like oh well if it doesn't look right then it's it's obviously going to contaminate just because it doesn't look right it's like no, that's not how it works but okay um yeah, so that was the the first big change that we made um, was we uh, we started experimenting with different grains uh, for the all in one bag. So we we did some with rye, we did some with uh, with Milo, um, and then eventually we decided, or we did some with oats too. Uh, and then we decided, like, hey, let's try doing a mix of grains. Um, so we we tried um, oats and Milo was like the last one that we tried, and we really liked it. It worked really well. It grew fast um they both of those grains hold a reasonable amount of uh of moisture and they both are pretty high in carbs um 
so we talked with our uh our grain company that we get our stuff from and they're they were able to get us um that grain custom mixed um so now we we buy that by the pallet from the uh the local grain mill um and yeah it works really great um that's definitely the grain that i recommend to most people um it's got a bunch of different things that are nice about it so yeah that's uh that was the first iteration of of changes to the uh to the all in one bag um after that we did some changes with the substrate um we started adding azomite to the substrate which is it's a volcanic ash um they farm it in uh utah or they mine it in utah um and yeah it just mimics the um nutrient or uh, mineral profile of manure without having to incorporate manure in the product um, so you're getting all of the benefits of manure without having to actually handle manure uh, with our location um, one the landlord wouldn't be happy if we had you know thousands of pounds of manure sitting in the building um, and two our weather uh, we're in illinois and so you know, five months of the year, it's really snowy. And so there's not like accessible manure uh, year round out here. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of filled the, as might filled in those gaps for us, which was really nice. We saw um, yield increases and speed increases with the substrate, adding azomite to it, um, about 10% on both sides. Um, so yeah, that worked out really well. And then the final addition to the all-in-one bags is we get um, custom-made bags from Unicorn Bags, uh, where we actually have the injection port placed lower down on the bag so that it's going to be right on the grain layer. Uh, you'll see bags on online where either they're having to adhere the injection port on themselves, um, which you know it takes a step, the injection ports can fall off, they can miss a bag or two, um, or the injection port is higher up on the bag, and so people inadvertently inject into the substrate, which can ruin the whole project. So yeah, we pay a decent amount to make sure that those bags are are working 100% how we want them to. They come out how we want them to. And uh, yeah, we use unicorn bags for that. We, uh, we've tried other bag manufacturers here and there, and no one's been able to meet the quality of unicorn bags. So yeah, that's who we stick with. I, I tried the cheap Chinese knockoffs, felt the exact same way. They're, they're not the same bag. I don't care. No, anybody that tells you, oh, they're fine. I mean, they might be fine for you, but if you are a vendor and, and you need to sell a quality product and you don't want to come in back all the time, there is literally no better bag. Yeah, there's, we will have, you know, bag vendors message us and I'll, I'll take their samples. I'll try them. But, you know, when we're purchasing, you know, 10,000 plus bags every month, if you have even a 1% defect rate, that's, you know, a hundred orders, we don't need a hundred people to not like us right from the get go because of something we didn't have control of. Uh, unicorn bags, we, it's very rare that we run into an actual manufacturer defect. Um, typically it's just something that we notice where like maybe the, the uh, plastic square behind the filter didn't come out all the way. So someone has to pull that out, but like that's maybe one in every case of a thousand bags that might happen. So yeah, for the most part, Unicorn Bags is uh, has been a great partner with us. I say to everybody, I go, man, I'm getting too old to waste my time. Like, I'm too old. Just, man, I loved it when you said, right, that first step. If the first step is wrong, everything else is wrong. It's like if you're, right, you're doing target practice with a bow and arrow. If that trajectory isn't right, you're not gonna hit a, you're not gonna hit the bullseye. It's gonna go off in the woods. It's gonna, it's gonna be wrong. It, it definitely amplifies over time and uh quality bag. If you're pressure cooking those bags, um, it matters. It's good to have a good bag. Uh, I just had, I was using somebody else's bags. I'm not going to name names, but I got it for free. So I used it. And just in the break and shake, I'm like holding the bottom seam. I'm holding the top seam and I'm just going like this and in that process. Somehow it just tore open and went everywhere. And I'm like, wouldn't wouldn't have happened with the unicorn bag. I still uh we we spawn bags here now. We we started growing some gourmets and we probably go through like 50 plus bags every week now and yeah, I still haven't had any that have ripped or popped on us, nothing like that. So I I do know that every now and then 
it, it can happen. Maybe the impulse sealers heat up too much or something. And so, you know, a customer gets mad that uh, a bag got missed over, you know, there's a slight tear or something every now and then that happens or, you know, bags pop in shipping because the UPS guy like threw them down too hard, that kind of stuff. But yeah, for our, our use here, still have yet to have a bag pop or break or have a tear, nothing like that with our personal use. So um, yeah, everything works really well with those bags. All right, man. So, so I, I was mentioning labor and I've, I've had a couple guests on who have gone from being the one man op to hiring people. And I've definitely heard for every success story, I hear at least w one or two times the amount of failure stories. So walk me through you going from being, I remember when I'm pretty sure it was just you to now you got a bunch of employees. What was that a learning process? Um, did you have any background from previous work that kind of gave you a heads up in that or, or how, how, what was that journey? What did that look like for you? Uh, yeah. So when I first started off, we started off, uh, just with like an Etsy store. Um, I was doing that by myself. I was uh, able to handle everything pretty easy. Um, I was looking back at it the other day, we would have weeks where we had like three sales when we first started off and it was like, Nice, we got a sale. Like I'm still always happy with every sale that we get. You know, I'm always thankful that we're having customers, but like the difference is astounding. Um, yeah. And so basically when things started to pick up, um, I would ride my bike. I had, I, my parents gave me this little, like, uh, like bike trailer that had, you know, like a little covering on it and stuff. And the post office is right around the corner from my house. So I would just load that up with our boxes, ride that over to the post office and I got to a week where I was like, oh, man, I got to bring my car. I'm, I'm not going to be able to fit all these on the bike. And then that kind of turned into where I was like kind of stressing out because Etsy, you like have to drop off packages by a certain date. And um, yeah, that's always fun. And um, yeah, I was getting stressed out because it was like, all right, well, the I don't like leaving the pressure cooker at home when I was using pressure cookers, I don't like leaving those unattended, no matter how long it is. I'm just paranoid like that. And so it was like, man, I, I really have to take these boxes to the post office, but the, the cooker's still running. I don't want to have to turn it off and mess with everything. So I asked a friend, he was working around the corner. Um, if he would be able to come over and take the boxes to the, uh, to the post office for me, he said, sure. So he started doing that for us. Like every other day he would come drop off the packages. And then eventually he was like, you know, I, I could help like do some of this stuff so that you're not like freaking out about like packing stuff all by yourself. And I was like, all right, yeah, sure. That sounds good. So he started helping me. Um, and then, yeah, the orders just kept on coming. And so got like a Shopify store and, um, eventually was like, all right, we, we need a bigger building. We, I was, the, our our house we had a kitchen upstairs and the basement downstairs the basement was where we had flow hood and everything and so i was having to carry the pressure cooker downstairs full of grain get it in front of the flow hood and everything and it was just a whole thing so it was like all right i'm gonna invest in in the company all the money that we're making we're just gonna put it towards getting a facility so we get this facility i found a nice place like right down the street from our house good price nice landlord guy um we rented this place out and it was uh 1500 square feet when we first came in um the first week that we got here i got a uh an actual autoclave delivered as well talked with an electrician got that hooked up and we were looking around and it's like man are we gonna be able to fill this place up did we get something too big is this is this a mistake should we have gotten something way smaller and uh yeah, about six months later, we had the landlord knock down two of the walls and we took over another um, like 3,600 feet. We went up to 5,000 square feet then. Um, and yeah, it was uh, when we first got here, it was me and my buddy. His name's Austin. Um, not the Austin that you know, different Austin. Um, it was just him and I and we were doing pretty solid and we were starting to you know, see another uptick in orders, um, things just going pretty well. And so it was like, all right, well, I guess it's time. Like we could use another employee soon. And so we have a guy come in one day and he's like, Hey, I'm local. I placed an order online. Can I just pick it up? So give him his order. And like the next day he sent an email to me and he's like, are you guys hiring? 
I was like, yeah, sure. We, uh, we were talking about it. So yeah, let's, let's try it out. Let's see how it goes. And, uh, he's still here. His name's Joey. He's, uh, like, you know, I guess like second in command kind of, he helps out a, a ton here. Um, yeah. And since then it's just been kind of, uh, yeah, every time that we're seeing, you know, a steady, steady, uh, output, we tend to have, you know, another little rise in sales. And so it's like, I guess we can use another employee. And, um, yeah, now we have, so we, we ended up having to hire some people for packaging, um, just to help out with that daily packaging. Um, whenever we came here, it was just Austin and I, Austin would do the packages and then eventually it got to be like, okay, we need both him and I doing production stuff. So I asked my wife if she could come and start doing the packaging. And so she quit her job or went down a part-time and then eventually quit her job. Um, so my wife was handling all the packaging, but then it was so much packaging that she needed help too. So, um, yeah, friend's daughter came in and started working there. And, uh, yeah, now I think we have seven full-time employees, including second shift. Um, we actually just had a guy start today, another guy start today. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah, I, um, I do have a history with, uh, with management. Um, I used to manage hotels. I was a general manager for, um, two different hotel chains. Uh, I used to also be a night manager for a, a different hotel chain. Um, did that for a while. I think that really motivates me to make sure this is a, a success because I don't want to go back to managing hotels. Um, so yeah, I used to do a lot of hiring, handling employees with that. So, um, yeah, I have a little bit of management background. Um, I've also ran other small businesses, so I have a little bit of understanding of like business paperwork kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and just kind of picked it up as I've gone along. It's it's definitely a learning process. A lot of this stuff, uh, learning you know regulations on stuff and like payroll requirements, and now we're doing four hundred one k, and so learning all that stuff has been, uh, you know, fun but a challenge. Uh, growing pains, I guess you could call it. Um, but yeah, we, we have a really solid team here. Um, we have a really good training regiment. We make sure, uh, consistency is the main thing. Um, kind of have a, uh, a rule of thumb where it's, if somebody's messing something up, there's going to be a couple more people who handle that product. Um, since we do have the second shift, there's the second shift guy will handle your stuff. Then the packing team will handle your, handle your stuff. And then the customer will be the last person who handles your whatever you're producing. So if somebody on our team doesn't catch any mistakes and the customer is going to tell me, I don't like when the customers are telling me that things aren't good. So um, we make sure that everybody is very trained, very well trained. We make sure that everybody's working together to make sure that the customers are happy with everything that they're purchasing. Um, we also just like grab stuff off the shelves for us to use for growing um, all the gourmet stuff. So that's a little bit more of our, our quality control stuff is like, we actually use the materials that we're sending to customers. Um, and yet yeah, never notice any, any major issues or anything. And if it ever were to come up, we would know like, okay, who made this? We can go and talk to them and be like, dude, what are you doing? You're not sealing the bags, right? You know, stuff like that. So we have, um, we have a lot of stuff to make sure that everything is a hundred percent and to make sure that everybody's doing everything correctly, because I would be really upset personally as a customer, if I bought something and it wasn't how it's supposed to be. Um, a big thing that I tell people with, uh, with our help emails, it's just like, look, I, I just try to run the business how I would want a business that I shop from to run. So like a lot of times people will, you know, have a question and, say they need a replacement sent out, they'll be like, Oh, don't worry about it. I wasn't expecting anything. It's all right. I probably messed it up. And it's like, nah, we'll replace it. I'll send you a new one. I, I, I would appreciate it if that happened to me as a customer, you know, if something went wrong with something I bought, I'm going to make sure I would like it if somebody replaced it. So we do that. We make sure all the employees know, you know, the concepts of growing mushrooms. If they haven't before, um, we get, basically everybody that's worked here, we get them some lion's mane or oysters growing. So yeah, everybody's got a good understanding of how everything works. Everybody understands, you know, what, what we're looking for with all the products. Um, and yeah, we, we, uh, 
we try to make sure that the workplace is a nice place to work. You know, we do lunches like at least once. Usually I try to do it like once a week. We'll try to buy lunch for the whole team. Um, we do 401k for everybody. We uh, try to offer overtime, make sure everybody's getting raises and all that stuff. So, yeah, just trying to make it a, a great place to work. Um, and, yeah, it seems to work really well because, yeah, we've got multiple employees that have been here over a year. Um, we've only had, you know, this facility for almost two years now. Um, and yeah, most of the employees that, that we started, well, all the employees that we started with are still here. Our first hires are still here with us. So, well, that's a, you know, you don't got to work in management too long to know if your turnover is high, then you're doing something wrong. And if your turnover is low, you're doing something right. So that's, that's great. That doesn't surprise me. Also doesn't surprise me. You had some sort of background because for a lot of people, what I've noticed is the idea of starting a business sounds really cool. Really? I get to be my own boss. Oh, let's go. Let's do that. And then you become one and you're like drowning in the business corporate paperwork, the keeping up with this, the, the paying your workers comp insurance. And like, you're now talking about setting up a 401k, man, it, it's a lot of work. There, there's pluses and minuses to working for the man or being the man. Um, and it sounds like you're you're doing a great job of being the man. Yeah. There's yeah. I mean, nobody it's, leaving. It's definitely I I got my two year degree in business admin. So um, I did know that I wanted to do business stuff whenever I was younger. Um, whenever we first came here, you know, I, I might do emails like I might have five emails every day and now I come in and I've got, you know, like 30 most mornings. And so it has been, it's not the best uh, for me to come in and not get to do mushroom stuff. Cause like, I like doing that stuff. Now I've got an office whenever, cause we just took on more space in the building. We, uh, we got another 1600 feet. So now I have an office and I guess it's kind of useful cause I'm like stuck in this room now whenever I have to do emails. So I'm not, I used to just have like a desk in the corner over there and I would just like do emails and talk with the guys and do paperwork and stuff and like mess around with them. And now it is just like, I do spend a good portion of my day, uh, answering emails, looking into, you know, financial situations and purchasing stuff and making sure we have all these supplies and making sure everything's in order. And, um, yeah, right now we're finishing up an expansion project. And so it's like just a, a whole bunch of fun stuff. And, uh, yeah, being stuck in the office isn't the best, but it's it's definitely uh, part of the business. Um, I'm also the type of uh, of boss where I'm I'm the first one here and I'm the last one to leave. Uh, that's just how uh, I think that you know bosses should be. I was like that with the hotel too, where I would show up early and leave late. Um, luckily, my wife understands it. She uh, she appreciates that, and so it all works out. I think uh, the amount of effort that goes into you know, running your own business, the more effort you put into it, typically, the more results you'll see from it. So um, we do, I do go, you know, to music festivals and stuff still. And so with the amount of effort that I, that we've put in with making sure that the place can run when we're not gone, it kind of pays off whenever I'm gone for, you know, four or five days. And I come back and everything's still functional. And it's like, yes, it's, it's working. They, did, you know, that's, they didn't, they didn't burn the <laughs> the building down. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really nice. Um, being able to see that, yeah, the, the hard work is paying off and, you know, whenever we do have like really positive responses from people with our products and like, whenever we, you know, have like good, good days on, uh, on orders, it's like, all right, everything's working. It's all, it's all paying off. It's all, it's all coming out how it should, you know, those are, those are really nice days. Um, obviously there's also some, some bad days that, uh, that get to me, but I, I do truly enjoy running the business. Um, sometimes even on the weekend, I'll sit and answer emails because it's like, well, I guess I can do some mushroom stuff. I can answer some questions. I'll sit on Reddit on Saturday, Sundays, and I'll just answer questions on Reddit. And it's like, I guess, is this working? Like I'm just sitting on Reddit, but I guess I'm logged into the booming acres account so i guess it's work but yeah it doesn't feel like work a lot of the time so talk to me about this because that that brings up an interesting point right there there's the physical work of making a grain bag making a bag of substrate making whatever product we're talking about 
And for sure in this community, uh, I've seen people come and go even in the last three years and the people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do work, they do just fine. And the people who want to shortcut it and want to make it a trick and, and, and deceptive marketing practices and over promise under deliver, those people don't do well. And now you're talking about, you know, answering emails and going on Reddit and hanging out in a discord server. Um, and, you know, wondering whether that feels like work or not, but I mean, on one level, creating that presence and, uh, especially in a flooded market, in a market where every day there's somebody new deciding they're going to sell genetics, they're going to sell grain, they're going to sell this, they're going to sell that. Um, I mean, that's vital. Don't you think that's vital to have in that presence? I mean, how, how would you do it otherwise? You just, it'd just be peer paying for ads, right? So. Yeah, I mean, um, as far as like the marketplace goes, we we kind of have found our niche. We kind of do have that, you know, reputation. We've got, you know, so many reviews on Etsy and Amazon and all that. So that's kind of nice. We do have people that, you know, defend our name on Reddit, which is great. But uh, yeah, I mean, having that history is, is really big and it's taken us, you know, three years to get that solid history. Um, yeah, as far as, you know, the new vendors go. Um, I do think a lot of them do push off the customer service side of things. Um, I'll see people complaining about even the big vendors not answering emails or, you know, trying to blame them for things going wrong or like being rude to them. Um, I had someone tell me that a, a big vendor said like straight out, they said like, this sounds like a low IQ problem. And it's like, who would say that? That's crazy. Wow. But, yeah, I think that a wow. lot of vendors, yeah, that was a funny one. It's like, okay, well, Damn. yeah, so that, the person that wasn't, they were fine. So it's like, I don't understand that, but wow. yeah, um, no, nope. yeah, I think, I think a lot of the vendors do shrug off the, uh, the customer service side of things. Um, it is difficult. Um, sometimes you, you just have to, you just have to deal with it. If you've got a customer with a problem and you can be a hundred and ten percent certain that your product isn't what caused that problem, but that customer knows that it was your fault. No matter what you tell them, it was your fault. And so, even if you are absolutely certain that you're correct, even if you have you know temperature monitoring hardware that's telling you that everything was done correctly, it doesn't matter. You kind of have to deal with you know make the customer happy and just suck it up and. Uh, make things right. And even if they don't come back to you as a customer, even if they never say anything about you positively online or social media on reviews or anything, you did the right thing. And eventually if you do that right thing so many times, eventually it will be, you know, a positive for you. So I think that's where a lot of vendors have issues. Um, going back to the, the vendor is always the problem situation. Um, with that being so instilled in the community, if somebody's a new vendor, and say they sell, you know, 30 pounds of grain and it took them a day to make that. And the customer says like, hey, my package didn't arrive. My bag's broken shipping. My bag's all contaminated. I want a refund. The money that, that you're losing on that refund or the money that you're spending to have to send them that out again, um, that kind of is kind of like a gatekeeping effect where a new vendor can't afford, you know, sending out Re returns or uh, replacements because it costs so much more money. If uh, we, if even if our damage rate was less than 1%, if we had this amount of packages needing replaced that like 1%, if we had that damage issue when we first started, we, I wouldn't have kept the business going because, you know, it, it wouldn't have been profitable. So with so many people knowing that they're correct, that they didn't do anything wrong, it kind of gatekeeps from new vendors being able to come up because it's it can be kind of costly to replace, you know, so many orders. And there is kind of a learning curve to that. Um, we package our boxes completely differently than what we did when we first started. Um, we still have less than a 1% breakage rate, but with how many orders we sell, there's, you know, more to replace. And back then, we package things differently. And so we had higher breakage rates and somehow luckily enough, we, uh, we were able to get through those times where there was, you know, 
okay, we have to resend 10 three pound grain bags to someone because UPS threw the box around and there wasn't any padding in it to keep it safe. And so, yeah, all those bags popped. And so, um, that kind of keeps people from, uh, from being able to, to, to grow up, which I do see it as a negative. It, it would be nice to have more, more vendors in, in the community. I, I think that this, uh, this hobby is big enough where when I talk with other vendors, I say like, there's enough for everybody to eat. It's a huge market. I make friends with other vendors. Um, I try to make friends with as many vendors as I can, just because there's going to be times where I need help or the other vendors need help. And if we're all helping each other out, then it all works out nicely. You know, if, if someone's bad talking us in a Facebook group or in a, uh, on a Reddit post and another vendor sees that and they're like, Hey, I'm actually friends with that guy. I'm going to say something about that. Cause that's not, that doesn't sound like them, you know, it helps us out and I would do the same for them. So that, that kind of comes into play too. Um, we have had some other vendors that just, uh, I guess you'd say they, they don't play nicely with others. Um, I've had to issue, um, like cease and desist type things or DMCAs, whatever you call them from people stealing our product pictures and using them for their website or their Etsy account. We had someone doing it on Amazon. Somebody was using our pictures on Amazon and it's like, nah, man, you can't do that. That's, that's not allowed. Like take your own pictures. Like it's, it's yeah, there's some shady stuff. And sometimes the people are like, nah, I'm this, I'm using your stuff. You can't do anything about it. And it's like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, that's not how the game's played. Like get real, but, um, that's few and far between. Um, I'd love to say I'm surprised by that, but I'm not, not even remotely surprised that people are that audacious. Yeah. Yeah, It's the the online world. They think they can get away with everything and they, they do a risk assessment of like, well, is he going to really spend the money on an attorney and what can he really do? Yeah. I mean, people are doing shady motherfuckers are doing that all the time. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. And I mean, the fun part about it is like, we, we do have to have an attorney now because we're on Amazon. And so once you're on Amazon, you have an attorney and it doesn't really cost too much to just have a retainer for that attorney. So like, yeah, now if, if some, if I notice somebody using our stuff, it's like, okay, well, I already paid for them to get talked to. So I can just tell the lawyer about it. Like, it sucks that that's a whole thing, but it's like, why are you using our stuff? Like, I, I don't pay the attorney for that. I pay him, you know, for our trademark stuff. And it's like, it's a waste of everybody's time to be like, dude, you, that's not your picture. Take it down. Like, come on. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's unfortunate, but yeah, for the most part, other vendors in this community are awesome. Um, I like other vendors. There's a lot of vendors that, that I'm friends with. Um, I need to start getting out to more of like the mushroom festival stuff so that I can actually hang out with these people that I've talked to for years in person. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't have started a mycology business without the help of, uh, of another vendor. So yeah. Cool, man. This is what, I mean, you already know the climate in my discord. You already know some of the people who helped me run that discord, right? Work together. We got to work together. Like we like mushrooms, learn from the mushrooms, what do the mushrooms do, right? They're, they're myceliating. They're making connections. They're, they're trying to work together, grow a network. That's, that's what it's all about. But, but not, not everybody gets that. Not, not everybody is here for the right reasons. And those people don't succeed long-term, maybe very short-term. They can trick people out of some money, but long-term guys like you are the people who, uh, who prove who they are and what they're all about and they have staying power and, and a work ethic. And that at the end of the day, that still has currency in our country. It's not just marketing campaigns and fluff. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's enough for everybody to eat. Um, we carved out our niche and you know, that took a lot of work. It took a lot of, you know, figuring out. And so it's like, look, if you want to be a vendor in this space, like, find your niche, carve it out. There you go. Um, you know, some niches are bigger than others. So yeah, you can get into the same niche as other people. Sometimes you find something that's like a solid niche and that's you now, you know? So it really is about putting in the work, uh, with, with how big this, this scene is, you shouldn't have to ride on anybody's coattails to make your, 
to make your product work or to make your business work. It, it's you're very capable of doing things with with your own two hands, really. Like you're talking about the steady growth, right? You just you're doing the work and, and slow and steadily the the business grows. I I think we're nowhere near capacity of where this industry is going. And so I can easily foresee, and, and I mean, the problem with five pound grain bags um, is they weigh five pounds. So I can see a situation. It was really fascinating here. You say, I mean, I support more vendors. And, and at first I'm like, wow, that's an interesting thing to say. Like, why the fuck would he support new vendors? And then I'm like, wait a minute. But yes, you, you want more quality vendors. But as the community grows and as the demand grows, it's going to make sense for everybody. Like, right, if you're in the Midwest, it makes sense that you serve Midwest customers at a certain point where the demand is so high that that then the guy in who's making grain products and substrate products in California sells to the California people. Just, just, it just makes sense eventually. But right now, I don't, I don't think we're, I don't think we're there quite yet, but. I, I believe it's coming though, man. I, I, I believe I keep telling everybody like with microdosing uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms, I think it's going to be the next cup of coffee. I, I, I 100% do. And when it's the next cup of coffee, it's, we can't even fathom the volume that, that we're talking about with some of the stuff, the, the volume of grain, the volume of substrate, the volume of azomite uh, additives, the volume of what whatever micro supply and genetic we're talking about it's it's going to be a lot and and the people who will stay um, is going to be the quality vendors we already have an impact now on the local farms because we need you know so much supplies and so it's like like we we had a couple months back where we couldn't get rye because we bought it all and like that's an issue and so it's like and that's that's just one company and so it's like all right there's definitely going to be an impact where yeah, more, there is going to be more demand. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's more than just, you know, like microdosing or magic mushrooms. It's, it's all of these functional mushrooms and people are learning more and more about them. And, you know, there's other, other supplements that come from mushrooms that aren't necessarily just like, here's, you know, lion's mane or heresiums or what have you. Um, and extracting from those mushrooms even is going to have an effect. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's plenty for everyone to eat, really. It's just find your niche, and yeah, there's plenty out there. And Yeah, I mean, doing the doing the work is definitely important, and I think that, that applies for, uh, yeah, growing a business. And uh, yeah, even if you're, you know, using the products of this business, that's do the work, yeah, on both sides of things. Yeah, man. All right, dude. Well, this was great. Um, I mean, I've I've literally known you since I think just about the beginning or, or very close. And uh, it's been so cool to see you grow. Um, it's been cool to see you 100% for people watching. I can tell you right now, he participates in this community. He is a part of this community. He has taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in small and large ways how to get better at cultivating mushrooms and working hard and here you are do, doing fantastic. So I'm, I'm proud of you. I, I think it's been really cool to watch all that. And uh, I think this day and age right now, especially with what's been going on on Facebook, a uh, little bit of instability for a lot of the, um, both consumers in, in the, in the space and some of the vendors, I think just you're really a role model and a testament to what works and what, what works is giving a shit, hearing about doing it right, doing the work, providing excellent customer service. If you do those things, like you're saying, I, I don't know how you fail. You yeah. just, you, you just keep doing it and, and, and it works out. Yeah. Cause I nobody mean, else is doing that. Yeah. A lot of people, they worry about, you know, how much money are they going to make? And for us really, it's just like, uh, that'll come, you know, with time, let's just make sure we're sending out good products, send them out on time get them delivered well, have good customer support whenever they need it, have good instructions. And, you know, the rest comes in, comes in later. I, I, I didn't pay myself for a year and a half when we started this. I, I luckily enough had savings. And so I was able to just throw everything back in. And um, yeah, I mean, I still just try to put all the money that we can back into the business. Anytime there's something we can do to improve things, that's where it all goes. I'm not trying to, you know, 
buy boats or big houses or anything like that. I'm just trying to make sure that, you know, everybody's happy with everything here and, you know, educate as many people as we can get more people into mushrooms. I'm with you. I like it. It's what I'm all about. All right, dude. Well, this was great. Um, thank you for uh, stopping by and, and chit chatting with me a little bit. Um, I know we'd like casually talked about it a couple different times. Some um, only took two years. That's good. We got you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for having. You were too. Me. You were too busy making all in one bags and substrate bags yeah, and grain I'm bags. Busy with something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool man. Well, yeah. Great chatting with you, man. Yeah. Take care, man. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. All right, guys, that was Howard of Booming Acres, and the acres are booming. I'm telling you, I've watched this guy just nose to the grindstone, just doing it, just delivering, working hard. He's in the Discord all the time. His, other guys, mine, just helping people out, trying to be available, trying to teach people how to grow mushrooms. And uh, I really see him, he's like an important stepping stone, right? There's a lot of people just flooding into the space and they want it to be fun and they want it to be exciting. And that might mean transitioning them from not knowing what the hell they're doing and say, okay, cool here, let's get you some grain. Let, let, let's, let's work you backwards. Let, let's get you an all-in-one grow bag. Let's get you some LC. Let's see if you can grow some mushrooms as, as easy as we can possibly make it. Oh, cool. Great. You can do that. All right. Let's work backwards now. Now we're going, you're going to get some grain this time. And then we're going to see if you can spawn to bulk and just kind of slowly work backwards. Uh, and then people just enjoy this process a little bit more. There is no, I get it, guys. 20 years ago, you had to figure it all out yourselves. It is uh, and that's what a lot of us would have done if we started doing it back then. Well, you don't have to now. Now you have options, you have choices. And for a lot of people, man, that's the way to go. I, I tell you, I just whipped up some substrate yesterday. It's not my favorite thing to do. I, I, it's not where my joy is. In front of the flow hood, I can do that all day, every day. Uh, mixing substrate with a paddle mixer, not my idea of a good time. Um, if I ever had enough money to, to, to exclusively buy my substrate, I probably would. I probably would do that. Anyway, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. You know, if, if you guys are young vendors, you know, he's, he's a role model. He's a standard to live up to. If you guys are looking for somewhere to maybe buy quality products from, Howard is definitely one of those guys. Um, get, you know, give him a try. He, he's got a lot of stuff for really great prices. Anyway. Definitely, definitely fall now, guys. Weather's getting cooler. Um, just this past weekend, I was out in Hocking Hills uh, again with, with, with all the homies, uh, hunting some mushrooms. Stay tuned for some posts on that. That was a good time. Um, did some cool stuff. Got some stuff to share with you guys. And uh, yeah, you know, winter, winter's going to be here before you know it. So that means you guys got to, you know, get down in your basements. Roll up your sleeves. Don't press the